being recorded. Uh, participants will be on mute until the Q&A. Please use the chat to report technical issues only. Please use the Slido link for the structured Q&A as previously mentioned. If you do put an anonymous question, it is very unlikely to be answered. So please do use your name. Uh, you may be asked to direct your question in person, so please be prepared to do so. Uh, and lastly, uh, raise your hand during the open discussion at the end if you wish to ask a question directly. Right, Roger, that's enough from me. I'm now going to uh, give you control. Well, thank you very much. I, Major, I appreciate being um, invited to speak for Fight Club and the webinar series. And I also appreciate all the people that have tuned in today, either tonight or today, wherever you're at in the world. And our topic is going to be wargaming hybrid warfare. And, and to begin with, um, as a major mention, we have a lot of people that will be involved in this. Some are definitely subject matter experts, some are new to the topic. So this presentation is going to take kind of a middle of a road uh, approach. To begin with, I think we need a definition. What is hybrid warfare? It's a strategy that blends conventional warfare, irregular warfare, cyber warfare, and subversion. The goal is to erode the will and capability of its victim nations, and it blurs the lines between peace and war. Okay, now I'm going to try to advance the slide here. Oh, we don't know. Let's see, let's go to, I'm gonna go up here to slideshow and hit that from the beginning. Let's see from current slide. There we go. Where are we going? We're gonna discuss the concepts of hybrid warfare and we're gonna look at some case studies. These will be brief case studies. But what I really want to focus on is eight steps to designing hybrid war games, because that's what, what Fight Club was about is war gaming. And so we're going to discuss eight steps to designing hybrid war games. To begin with, let's talk a little bit about the topic of war in the gray area. Where did this concept come from? Starting in the 1990s, people like Frank Hoffman, MLR Roberts, Sophie Smith began penning articles about war in the gray area. And what they were describing is, it's a conflict spectrum between peace and open warfare. Okay, it keeps, every time I click on it, um, Major, every time I click on it, it goes back to uh, our current slide. So let me see if I can get this back on here. Okay, so our, our first example we'll talk about are the Spratly Islands. Since 2003, the Chinese have been seizing small islands and reefs in a semicircle beginning at Malaysia and Vietnam and extending across the bottom of the South China Sea all the way to the Philippines. They've expanded these islands and reefs by dredging and extensive engineering. And the goal is to trade the nat to control trade of the South China Sea. And that includes the trade and natural resources in the area. They're calling this the, let me say it. They're calling this the nine dash line. And the nine dash line represents their control of these strategic areas. Major, if you wanna control that, why don't you go ahead? Um, one of the problems I'm having is the thumbnails on the right hand side, that's where I need to click to advance the slide so I can't reach it with my, my cursor. So next slide. Yeah, Roger, got it. Got it, so next slide. So what are we talking about? We're talking about blurring the lines. The gray area is the region between peace and war. 
And is this new? No, this is not new. This is something that's gone on for, for many years. However, what we're seeing is a greater use of technology and sophistication. We see contactless hybrid operations are replacing military confrontations with the goal is to, is to achieve strategic victory short of open conflict. When this began, many of the countries that were using hybrid warfare, for example, China, Russia, Iran, uh, they were avoiding one-on-one -on -one peer conflicts because of the cost and also because of their limitations in technology, capabilities, logistics. As those capabilities have grown, they've realized that there's value in contactless hybrid operations. And so they've continued this and they've also become more sophisticated. Okay, next. So what are the tactics of hybrid warfare? Well, what we're trying to do is achieve strategic objectives. You're employing military and non-military overt and covert means. And, and how do you do that? Well, you can use special operations, cyber, use of proxies, economic attacks, and information warfare. Hybrid warfare is usually um, evaluated at three levels. The first level would be like irregular guerrillas. They're limited in sophistication of their weapons and communications and have limited abilities to maneuver in large groups. The second level would be state-sponsored hybrid warfare. And this is where an outside actor provides training, sophisticated weapons and communications that allow the growth of capability of this local hybrid actor. And the third would be state conducting hybrid warfare. That would be, for example, we'll talk later about Russia invading Crimea. That would be an example of that. Um, how does this work? Well, when the Houthis started in Yemen 20 years ago, they were very, very limited in their capabilities. And now through the support of Iran, their hybrid capability has reached the point um, I read this morning in the UK papers that there was a drone attack, attempted drone attack on the Saudi oil fields from Yemen by the Houthis. So they have not only um, increased in their footprint of what they control, but they've also increased their sophistication of their hybrid attacks. This has led to a, a secondary phenomenon of follow-on hybrid warfare. The Houthis now have terrorist groups that they're supporting with training and equipment, and those terrorist groups are now increasing in their ability to conduct hybrid warfare. Besides tactics, there's also been um, a development of new military theory. The Russians have got something they call reflexive control theory. Reflexive control theory is about eroding the will and capability of a nation to resist. And the way they do it is they use a variety of tactics that either can deter you from conducting military operations, provoke you to begin military operations, uh, cause division, deception, distraction. And the goal is really to uh, set up paralysis and exhaustion. And that uh, allows, that provide, that basically what you're doing is you're preparing the battle space. So if you decide you want to invade with, with uh, conventional forces, you're gonna be that much stronger. Or if you want to leverage economic opportunities or negotiations, you're in a much better position. So not only do you have the, the, the tactics of hybrid warfare, but now you have new theories coming out of the tactics of hybrid warfare. Okay, next. There are six characteristics we're gonna be talking about today in hybrid warfare. Okay, next. Now, the first one is the expansion of the MPECI tool set. And this is something that I think most of the, most of the people tuning in today are gonna to be familiar with military, political, economic, communications, and information. But how, how have nations involved in hybrid warfare in the past 20 years, how, they have, how have they expanded this tool set? Well, there are several areas. First, AI and machine learning. Uh, there has a, been a series of reports 
by Western intelligence analysts that the Chinese are developing a large database called the Wenhua database. And what that is, is that's information about individuals in areas where they may want to conduct hybrid warfare operations. Another expansion is uh, leveraging the electromagnetic spectrum. And you have groups like Hezbollah who have really taken the lead in developing media strategies and media campaigns to establish narrative narratives to go along with military operations. So there's been a tremendous expansion of the MPECI tool set. Okay, next. Now, the second characteristic is widening target parameters. Hybrid warfare, the objectives of hybrid warfare are to avoid one-on-one -on -one matchups with the enemy. And they do that by targeting non-traditional targets and especially targets that promote secondary effects. Okay, next. Clausewitz in the 19th century was talking about identifying and targeting centers of gravity to defeat your enemy. Hybrid warfare now is, is about identifying centers of gravity, establishing those centers of gravity, and being in a position to take advantage of them even before the enemy is aware of them. Imagining selecting a battlefield behind your enemy lines, ensuring you're in control of every important point, and then declaring war. Okay, next. Probably the best example of this is the China, China's project they call Silk Road. The One Belt, One Road initiative is part of a physical infrastructure communications and information systems development program throughout the third world. What the Chinese are doing is they're building leverage points that can be controlled or subject, subjected to hybrid warfare through coercion. Uh, two examples, the Chinese operations in Myanmar. The Chinese have signed an agreement for the China-Myanmar Energy Corridor. It runs from the, the coast of Myanmar and the Bay of Bengal into China. Now, what's the advantage of that? Well, first off, it allows the Chinese to get, to get oil delivered to China without going through the South China Sea makes the trip much shorter. The second thing is it really exposes the flank of India. India is a peer competitor with China. Prior to this, the uh, Indians had Myanmar on their left flank as they faced the Bay of Bengal. Now China has control of this. Uh, one, of the one of the interesting things about hybrid warfare is it's changed greatly from uh, 1930s model with the, with the Germans of seizing surrounding countries. When, when Hitler seized Czechoslovakia, he had to put troops there, he had to administrate it, he had to control it. Well, the Chinese have no interest in doing that in Myanmar. There's a lot of problems, a lot of poverty, a lot of social issues. They have no interest. What they want is they want access to it. One of the reasons for this is several of these countries China, Russia, Iran have difficulty projecting logistics. So what they would do is, in this case in Myanmar, the Chinese now have set up a base where they can, they have a footprint now in the Bay of Bengal with a Navy base. They can put one there. They can control the country of Myanmar and they have complete access. If they want to do a conventional invasion through Myanmar into, China, into India, then everything is set and in position to do this. Another example would be the Horn of Africa in Djibouti. When I was there in 2007, the uh, only outside military were the French Foreign Legion and US forces at Camp Lemonnier. Well, now the Chinese as of two, 2017 have built a large naval base there. So what this does is these are all centers of gravity and the Chinese, they're centers of gravity in a future war Well, the Chinese are already there. They've already won those centers of gravity. Okay, next. Now the Russians, the Russians have done a lot. Initially, the Russians did a lot of cyber coercion. Uh, 
they used this against neighboring countries that were former Soviet republics, for example, Estonia, Georgia, and Ukraine. But they have expanded that. Uh, the, the latest thing with the Russians are, is they're now in the business of peacekeeping. Uh, one of their first large peacekeeping attempts was in Syria, where they put forces into Syria and put themselves in a strategic position there. The most recent, as of the last couple of weeks, is they've been involved in the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict, Nagorno-Karabakh, and uh, they helped to broker a deal, a peace deal. But part of that peace deal is they're going to bring in Russian peacekeepers. What is the purpose of the Russian peacekeepers? Well, of course, they're going to be setting up in the most strategic positions to control both of those locations and allow them to set up logistic bases, which is exactly what they had when they captured Crimea. All right, next. The third characteristic of hybrid warfare is attack synchronizations. Attacks are synchronized and the objective is to overwhelm your opponent, okay? All right, next. And what the synchronization does is it, it serves as a force multiplier because what it's doing is it, it's contributing to horizontal escalation. The victim is now dealing with increasing number of coordinated threats. And what we're gonna talk about a little bit later about in complexity in hybrid warfare is as, it, as you deal with more threats, the threats now start to build on each other and they begin to overwhelm the solution sets that the, the victim has. Okay, next. The exploitation of uncertainty. Uncertainty in hybrid warfare, in complete, it increases the complexity and problem solving. What do I mean? A nation that's prepared to defend itself has existing solution sets. How are they going to conduct operations? Where do they expect to be invaded from? What type of attack will they, will they have to face? And they've prepared solution sets. Because of the uncertainty of hybrid warfare operations, where you're blurring that, those operations, and you're operating between peace and war, the solution sets you have, you can't use. So it's invalidating those solution sets. Uh, the time and money that, that you have invested in those things, the training and the expectations you have that they'll be used are now invalidated. And what it really does is it inhibits aggressive countermeasures. You're not sure what's happening, so it's difficult to take action. Okay, next. It also decreases visibility. It lowers the attack profile. When the, in 1939, when the Germans crossed the Polish border, there was no question it was the German army. But when you begin with a cyber attack directed at the economic structure of a neighboring nation, you shut down their Wi-Fi or maybe their utilities, the first question is, is this an attack? Are these criminal hackers? Who, who's responsible for this? And this leads to what response do these warrants actions warrant? Do we go to war? Uh, no enemy units have crossed our border. Now do we attack our neighboring country just because we suspect them? So this decreased visibility is gonna lower the attack profile. Next. The next problem of hybrid warfare is it freezes the conflict. Now, many countries, especially in Eastern Europe, have been moving towards closer relations with the Western democracies. A good example would be the Eastern Europe, the Baltic. They want NATO membership, economic ties, economic development. What hybrid warfare does is it foments instability. And that instability means that all these alliances, all these opportunities, people are going to be, or countries will be reluctant to get involved with them in an area that's in constant conflict. So what it means is hybrid warfare doesn't mean victory, doesn't mean you've defeated the enemy, 
but by freezing the conflict, it means the conflict will continue indefinitely and you erode the confidence that people have in your country and also it reduces uh, the attractiveness of being involved in a certain area that's always in conflict. Okay. Now the challenge of attribution. We have uncertainty. We've got the complexity of not knowing where these attacks are coming from or who's responsible. And what this does is the ambiguity robs the victim of the leverage of attribution. You know, if if a country like one of the Baltic states is attacked and a cyber attack, well, who's responsible? It's difficult to have a vigorous response. Nobody wants to get involved when we're not sure who the actual attacker is. And it really prevents, it prevents the victim state from responding vigorously. Okay. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some, uh, oh, just quickly a summary. So what are we talking about? Next, we're promoting uncertainty and threat conditions. We have synchronized attacks that lead to horizontal escalation. We have increased complexity of problem solving by the nation that's under attack, which delays their response and limits their response options. Okay, thanks. Next. Next thing we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about some examples of hybrid warfare. Um, we have one hour today, so we're going to go briefly through these. We'll go through them quickly because, <clears throat> as I said, I want to focus on wargaming. Fight Club's about wargaming, and we're here to talk about wargaming hybrid warfare. Estonia, 2007. The Estonians had progressively been moving farther from Russia. And their parliament voted to remove World War II war memorials from the center of their capital to their military center cemeteries. Okay. Now, how did the Russians respond? Next. The Russians responded with a three-stage hybrid attack. They began bombarding um, Estonia with false news stories about the memorials and war graves being destroyed. Now there's about a 17 to 20% ethnic Russian population in Armenia. I mean, I'm sorry, in Estonia. So of course there were people there that were interested in this. Secondly, pro-Russian agitators organized demonstrations and that finally led to rioting and looting in the capital of Estonia. They followed up with a dedicated denial service cyber attack that shut down their banking system and their internet access. And this obviously is something that reached out to every citizen in Estonia. So they, in a short period of time, with a three-stage hybrid warfare attack, they were able to significantly um, erode confidence in the Estonian government by their citizens. So next, what was the end game of all this? The end game was a disrupt disruption of the Estonian economy and serious damage to their cyber system. Attack attribution was never resolved. Estonia wanted NATO to get involved. They pointed to the Russians, but NATO refused to respond because it was impossible to positively verify who was responsible. Okay, next. Now, Crimea. Crimea is one of the most famous uh, examples of hybrid warfare. In 2014, Russia was pressuring the former Soviet Republic of Ukraine over the Crimea and Donbass regions. And they were, there was a lot of negotiation still going on. One of the things that was amazing is the Russians still had uh, military bases, active military bases inside Ukraine in the Crimea region. Next. Once the Russians decided to move, they used a series of synchronized attack. They used proxy operations by demonstrators and a group called the Night Wolves. And we'll talk about the Night Wolves a little bit later. They're the Russian state motorcycle gang, very interesting group, and we'll talk about some of their capabilities. They used cyber attacks, information warfare, 
and they use the first employment of what we call non-attributable forces. If you have an opportunity, take a look at the Johns Hopkins paper called Little Green Men. And that was the term that was used about these forces that suddenly appeared in Crimea, taking military action that had no flags, no markings on their vehicles, couldn't be identified in any other way than they were driving Russian vehicles with Russian equipment, but no one could say who they were. Okay, next. Came for uh, Crimea was Russia now claims that Crimea is fully reintegrated in the Russian Federation. So the Russians used had tremendous use of proxies and also non-attributable forces in their hybrid campaign in Crimea. Okay, now our third case study, and this is one that's going on even um, in the last week. India and Bhutan have a disputed border with China. Their point of contention is the Doklam Plateau. Now, both India and China have sizable military forces on the, in this area, but the borders are supposed to be demilitarized. Next. In 2017, in June, Chinese forces suddenly crossed the border checkpoint in Doklam. What they did was they crossed the checkpoint. They took all the Indians, they captured all the Indians there. They took every building, flagpole, sign, fence post, and uprooted it. They moved forward one mile. They brought in um, a large number of construction vehicles and construction equipment and reconstructed the checkpoint one mile inside in India and declared that this was the new border. Next. What was the end game? Well, the Indians responded with bulldozers and troops. They tore down the, the new border and moved it back to the original border. So what's happened since 2017? Well, there's been constant skirmishing. In June of 2020, a border patrol of unarmed Indian soldiers were attacked by Chinese soldiers armed with clubs and 20 Indian soldiers were killed. In the past few months, the Chinese have deployed a new weapon that has not been used before, and that's a microwave weapon. What they did is the, the Indians had a series of strategic positions on some high ground that the Chinese wanted to control. They brought up the microwave weapons and aimed them at these positions and turned them on. What the microwave weapons do is when they're pointed at a human being, they cause the water molecules in your skin to boil, which incapacitated all the Indian soldiers and basically the Chinese just walked in and took over. So that's that's kind of the situation. Okay, next. Those are three examples of hybrid warfare. So we've talked a little bit, we've given some, some, we've discussed what are the characteristics of hybrid warfare, what's involved. We've talked about three uh, examples of hybrid warfare. So now what are eight steps for designing a hybrid war, war game? What I wanna do with this is this will not be theory. I, I, I attend a lot of um, webinars, conferences where people talk about the theory of wargaming and the theory of designing war games. Uh, that's, that's very interesting, but that does not help you put a game on the table. And that's, that's kind of my background and where I come from. I wanna help you to produce something that you can actually use in whatever situation you're in. Okay, next. There are eight steps to designing a hybrid warfare that you should consider. Homework, understanding the problem, setting the game, how are you going to use this game, stakeholders who will be involved in the game, mapping the game, time movement and action, modeling the uncertainty that we talked about, establishing realistic victory conditions, and providing a measure of validation to your game design. Okay, next. 
these are practical tips for designing hybrid war games. And we originally, we use these to design an analog game, kind of a test game that we were working on. They can also be applied to electronic games if you have the time to do that. Okay, next. Okay, homework. Every war game, successful war game design begins with homework. That's Joseph Miranda. Um, those of you that play commercial war games um, may have played some of Joseph Miranda's over 400 games. Uh, he designs games for a variety of companies, including LECMGT. He's our chief game designer for LECMGT. And what he says is, you must understand three things about your game about about what you're learning. Who are the actors? What are the systems involved? And the points of potential conflict? Because you have to include these in your game. Okay, next. First off, the actors. What have they done? Well, you're going to have to historically take a look at what actors, your actors have done. For example, the Chinese on the Indian border, uh, the Houthis, whatever. You need to see what these actors have done. Next thing is, what do the analysts say about them? We have, uh, uh, you can see I, I'm sitting in our conference room. If, if every article, journal article on hybrid warfare that I'd read, I had available, I could probably pile them up six inches deep on this conference table. So there's a lot of analysts talking about this and you need to read about it. But more importantly, what do these people, these actors say about themselves? It's, it's very interesting because if you look at, um, I was recently reading a book by a man named Andrew, I'm gonna have to read this to make sure I get it correctly, Andrew Horabiko. He's with the Institute for Strategic Studies and Predictions at the People's Friendship University of Russia. Well, he's written a book on hybrid warfare, analyzing uh, Western operations and uh, talking about what uh, the Russians are doing. By the way, it's very interesting. The Russians do not use the term hybrid warfare. They use things like alternative approach, indirect approach. They use those terms, but they do not use the term hybrid warfare. That's a term that's been coined in the West. You can also look at Valery Gerasimov. Some people say, well, he as um, Russian chief of staff, some of his papers and speeches really outlined where the Russians were going with hybrid warfare. So you need to look and see what did these actors say about themselves. Okay, next. Next thing about hybrid warfare is understanding the systems. It's a systems problem that you have to look at. What are the elements and what are the interactions? What systems do these actors employ what systems exist in the prob probable theater of operations, and what are the interactions in these systems? Because they're going to be part of your game. If you want to have some type of face validation in your game design, these things need to be included. So what's an example of it? If I'm looking at, uh, if I'm studying the problem of hybrid warfare in the Baltics, I need to be reading the literature. And I not only the direct literature, but the indirect literature to understand the systems. Good example is the RAND, RAND study on the uh, sustainability of NATO armored forces in the Baltic. Okay, it's real easy to look at uh, a table of equipment or a table of organization and see, well, you know, the Americans have this many armored vehicles, uh, the UK has this much, French have this much, and we'll put them all in the game. Well, that's not necessarily reflective of the real situation. So you need to look at primary and secondary literature to understand these systems. Okay, next. Uh, this is Dr. Peter Perla, um, at least in the United States. Well, also internationally, he's well known as being one of the really the key thinkers in the world of wargaming. And what he says is games are participative, participatory narrative experience. If you don't understand how things work, like just like the systems I talked about, your narrative is going to be either superficial or inac inaccurate. 
So the depth of your background research is going to enrich that experience. The extent of your research is going to determine how the limits of your design. One caution, and we'll talk about this at the end, is you can't include everything in this type of game or any type of game. You're going to have to carefully decide and select. Hybrid warfare is no different. Uh, you know, you can make up a list of 35 different possible hybrid activities a hostile actor could have and try to include every one of them in the game. All it does is bog you down. You need to identify what you think is going to be valuable and what's useful in the game and then just include those. Okay, next. The next consideration is setting the game. Some people believe that war game design is like writing the great, the next great novel. That I'm going to sit down and I start with on a dark and stormy night and I will be such a genius that at the end of this, I'll have the perfect novel. In art, it's very interesting. Uh, in the history of music, for example, the only person that's ever demonstrated that ability was Mozart. Beethoven couldn't do it, Bach couldn't do it, all the great composers, nobody could do it, only Mozart, so it's really quite unusual. So what I'm getting to is you need to plan this out. You need to plan, and I call it setting the game. Who's the objective of the game? What's the objective of the game? Why are you doing a hybrid war game? Who is the end user? Who will be using it? Is it going to be... Um, cadets at a military academy, or is it going to be flag level staff officers? What's the operational level of the game? Is this a strategic hybrid game? Is this a tactical hybrid game? What is the operational level? And how do you connect the game to the topic? And as I said before, you just have, you have to limit what you can do. This is a good time in your game design, this is a good time to develop the architecture of your game. As I said, if you think that, well, I'm just going to put start a game and put the pieces on the table and have everything that could possibly do and let the game begin, and I'm sure it's going to turn out well, the game's going to get bogged down. You're going to have pro problems. What you need to consider is the architecture of the game and what is the framework that you're going to put all these things on it to make it a hybrid war game. Uh, a good example, a tool that I routinely use is storyboarding. If I'm designing a hybrid war game or any type of a war game or exercise, I develop a storyboard. Storyboard is commonly used in the movie industry. And it's a, it's a visual board that is related to the passage of time in the movie that, that they're doing. And it shows drawings and text explaining what happens at different points. This allows me to pace the war game. We're going to talk a little bit later about the use of uh, random events. Okay, well, I, I say, you know, I, I want to have random events. Okay, well, let's have a dozen. Okay, well, that's a lot of random events. Well, where are you going to put them? Oh, we'll just put them in wherever. You're going to have problems. So what I would do is using a storyboard to help develop the architecture or framework of the war game, I can determine and, you know, this game's probably, I can probably allow for three or four random events. Because if I have too many, it's going to disrupt the flow of the game. So this is the time. And setting the game is the time that you develop the architecture, figure out how the game's going to be used, and you ensure that you're going to have a product that's going to be most, more useful at the end. Okay, next. Now, stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders in this game? Stakeholders are, um, that's a concept that's not part of traditional war game. I'm designing a game about uh, the Battle of Waterloo. Well, I have the Allies and I have the French. There's no stakeholders. We have people that, um, we have the two adversaries. But hybrid war game, hybrid warfare is designed to draw in as many uh, parties as possible and influence them. So they need to be part of your game. Okay, next. Stakeholders, in, in there, it's a wide spectrum. 
connected to conventional, more than conventional combat. And oftentimes non-combatants become direct targets and they should be integral to your game design. This doesn't mean that in the history of warfare, non-combatants have not been involved. Of course they've been involved. But what we're talking about is in war gaming, including non-combatants. And there's ways that you can include them so they become separate and, and able to um, influence the game. One, one technique that you can use is, is very simple. It's agent-based modeling. You include units, not units, but you include the combatants in the game as playable pieces. You give them a series of what we would call preferences. Preferences are environmental conditions that may cause them to take some type of action, to flee, to move, to stay where they're at. And uh, you include that in the game. That's one technique you can use for stakeholders. But what other stakeholders besides non-combatants are you gonna have next? Well, when you select them, you're looking for the stakeholders whose actions are gonna have the greatest influence on the game. And uh, you, um, as I talked before, just like with the characteristics of hybrid warfare in your game design, you cannot put every single thing in the game that you have, just like you can't put every single stakeholder. But there are a few stakeholders. If you add stakeholders, just like random events, they can deepen and enrich, in the, enrich the narrative of your game. Next. All right, who, who are potential stakeholders? Well, you have the conventional forces, you have direct proxy forces, indirect proxy forces, and the civilians. All right, conventional forces next. This is probably the easiest part of your game design. Okay, next. Who are the conventional forces? Fielded and military forces, special forces, and non-attributable forces. Uh, you can see in the picture here, here's the Russian little green men. So those are the first stakeholders you should consider. Okay, next. Now, proxies. Proxies are very important. Direct versus indirect proxies. What are direct proxies? Militias, the Russian motorcycle gangs, the night wolves. There's a picture, I just like that picture. That's the leader of the uh, Night Wolves. By the way, uh, most of the members are former Russian Special Forces or um, members of their airborne units and private military contractors. That's another proxy that you should consider for your game. Who are, indir who are indirect proxies? Well, protesters and agitators. Now, one, one problem with conventional war games, um, actually, it's one of the things that makes war games uh, interesting and enjoyable to play is, for example, commercial war games are much like chess. You can see every piece on the board and you have full control. But as we know, in military operations, oftentimes uh, you don't have complete control and orders that you may give or intentions that you have are not carried out or alternative courses of actions are employed. And that's important in using proxies if you include that in your game design. Include the possibility that these proxies may not be completely under your control. A good example, does this happen in the real world? Absolutely. Uh, in Ukraine and the situation where a proxy unit is equipped with an anti-aircraft missile, what do they do? they shoot down a civilian airliner. Did um, the Russian government, did they sanction that and want that to happen? I really don't think so. I think that caused tremendous problems, but that's an example of you, could sh you should consider including proxies in your game, but also the possibility they're gonna have some random ability to do some random acts. Okay, next. Civilians. A really common technique for hybrid warfare is the use of civilians. And that involves staging conflict incidents between the, civil, uh, the civilians and government, agitating, tying down forces, 
Uh, civilians can be used to block roads. So civilians are an important part of the stakeholders you should consider for your game. All right, next is mapping. How do you map a hybrid war game? Well, the purpose of hybrid warfare is to get away from primarily kinetic conflict on a geographic plane. Doesn't mean it doesn't, it's not occurring, but that's not primarily where it occurs. So conventional war game mapping is a visual representation of a two or three dimensional space. And what you need to consider with hybrid warfare, if you're designing that game, you need to consider involving additional dimensions besides geographic representations. Next. How do you do that? Well, you're gonna to have to have conventional terrain. Now, that'll be part of your game. But you need to expand the concept of terrain because there are places that your forces or capabilities are going to maneuver or take action that are not necessarily going to be uh, on a map showing the geography of an area. They could be systems where operations occur, for example, cyber systems or systems effects. So how do you put all that on the map? One of the problems that you have is if you try to put all on the map, the granularity of the map reaches a point where it really becomes impractical to play the game. Okay, next. Consider the use of dashboards. Dashboards are um, a visual representation of, a, of, could be systems, effects, infrastructure, that's going to be impractical to do otherwise. Uh, this, this is an example of the test game we worked on. You can see the Estonian infrastructure. We have utilities, media, critical infrastructure, communications, and then there's also command and control and cyber capabilities. We put BaltNet, which is the uh, Baltic States command and control system. We put that on there. And this gives us an, a, ch a chance to include this in the game without having have a game map that shows every bridge, every power station, and this simplifies it, but it also allows it to still be part of the fabric and framework of the game. Okay, next. Time movement in action. Okay, there's got to, there's, in your hybrid game, you should consider time, movement, action. There's got to be time to recognize the threat, determine a course of action, and mobilize resources. You need movement to maneuver and action to mitigate that threat or respond to the attack or to attack. Now, hybrid warfare is designed to disrupt all three of these factors, so it's got to be included in the game. This is where your homework, I talked about earlier, the homework of understanding who the actors are, what the systems involved are. That's where the homework pays off. Okay, next. Probably one of the most significant things that you should consider is simulating time in hybrid operations. Now, you might wanna consider in your game mechanisms for manipulating time within the game. Think of a conventional war game. You have a time track. I play, you play, we go to turn two. I play, you play, we go to turn two. It's alternating. Well, perhaps you want to consider something that's going to increase the passage of time to limit movement and action. Maybe you don't get to move, take as many turns, and things are moving on. Or the opportunity to slow down the passage of time to allow for additional movement and action. So how do you do that? Um, by the way, this is part, um, how you control time in your game is related to the pacing and the game design. That'll be an important part of your architecture. Okay, next. One way to do it is to employ action points. What are action points? Action points enable movement and actions, and they establish um, the criterion for what's going to occur in the turn. And they can include combat, replacing losses, gathering intelligence. Very simple way is to have a series of action points. Uh, you determine how many actions that 
a particular player can take in during the turn as you're designing it. One of the things that we know is uh, in military operations, do all units move to the maximum of their movement capability and operational capability every turn? Can they do that? No, they can't. Uh, it's, it's a very, very dynamic cycle that goes up and down depending on the movement. This is, employment of action points is, a, is um, really a useful device for, the, device for the abstraction of environmental conditions and capabilities. And this is where you can include some of the internal details that will support face validation. All right, next. Next thing is determining the strengths of the units. Okay, well, this is hybrid warfare. I mean, this is this is a little difficult. I'm not sure. How do we do this? Joseph Miranda has a has a useful criterion for evaluating modern combat effectiveness. First thing is cohesion. The greater the robustness of leadership and logistics, the stronger a unit will be. And flexibility. A unit with more command and control assets will become more flexible and capable. And that's interesting because I talked about earlier um, an, an analysis system for looking at hybrid warfare of a regular state sponsor and state hybrid. And what were one of the key indicators of that command and control? Okay, next. In determining the um, strengths of units, you should also consider zones of control. And that's based on the range of the unit and any special capabilities that that unit may have. So those are the two things, zones of control and special capabilities. Uh, example of special capability, increased cyber war capability, hyper war capability for a unit. So those are, those are some of the things that will help you determine the strengths of the units. Okay, next. A very, very important part of, of um, hybrid warfare, of course, is cyber operations. They're a critical function. And so accurately simulating it requires an understanding of how your game actors will use it. Okay, next. So how do they use it? Well, it's interesting. In the Baltic states and in some Eastern European countries, they do not have billions of dollars to spend on command and control software. What do they do? They use commercially available apps for their cell phones and they have modified them for command and control. So this gives you an idea of how the, you need to look at how are the real world actors using cyber. So when you model it, there's validation. Okay, next. All right, seventh is victory conditions. Traditional war games, oh, oh wait, I'm sorry, I missed one. Sixth, modeling uncertainty. Uncertainty is a big part of um, hybrid warfare. You should consider hidden movement, random events. One thing about random events is you've got to limit the number of random events. If you have too many cataclysmic random events, the game is going to be constantly um, shipwrecking as it goes through. Consider the use of chit draws and cards. Also fluctuating control, the amount of control that you have over various units in the game. All right, next. Victory conditions. Traditional victory conditions employ conventional combat results. However, hybrid warfare, as we know, uses more than just kinetic effects. All right, next. Uh, I recommend that you take a look at uh, J. Boone Bartholomew's paper called A Theory of Victory. He talks about employing scales to determine decisiveness and achievement. Uh, decisiveness, can the defender mitigate the impact of a hybrid attack? Scale of achievement, can the attacker successfully conduct a hybrid attack? It's a little bit different than just saying, you know, we have 3-1 advantage and you're destroyed. All right, next. So you've gone all the way through, you've designed your game. Now, how do we validate your game? The final step. 
validation is the holy grail of war gamers and everybody wants to have that perfect game that accurately models and simulates and predicts future events. Next. So this is really impossible. Scientific validation of a war game is impossible because the techniques that's used for scientific validation of an experiment don't work in war gaming. All right, next. So what can be done? What you can do is the value of, of a war game is having a tool to help you to understand possible future outcomes. And what this really does is the war games will offer you some predictive focus. So there's three things you can do to validate your war game, your hybrid war game, okay? All right, next. The three things are, okay, one more slide. Face validation, does it represent the real world? Construct validation. Do the players, are they allowed to make decisions and take actions that reflect the real world? And third is content validation. Does your content agree with expert opinion? Okay, next. Other design tips. Make a list of everything that you wish to include in the game and then ruthless review and cull it and avoid including everything. All right, next. So where can I learn about hybrid warfare? What would I do? I'm, real, I'm really interested in this. This is just a brief list. Um, I didn't include the Indian Institute for Defense Studies. They've done some, some fascinating thing. Uh, there's a new, op, new um, Center of Excellence at Juan Carlos University in Madrid studying hybrid warfare. So there's a tremendous amount of information and this is just a starting point. Once you have mined all the resources, then you're ready to move on to some deeper learning. Okay, next. And that's, that's a one hour overview of what are the characteristics of hybrid warfare, some case studies of hybrid warfare, and approaches to designing some steps, eight steps for designing hybrid war, war games. And with that, I think we're ready for questions. We're exactly on one hour. Dr. Mason, thank you. You, uh, you, you uh, held up to your end of the bargain and spoke exactly to time. So thank you very much. Very interesting uh, discussion on both topics. Uh, so that does bring us to the structured Q&A. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to Alex, who's moderating, uh, to pick the first question. Yeah, thank you, um, Dr. Mason, indeed. Very, very interesting. So th the first question, um, going straight into uh, the top one, is of our Belgian friend, uh, Benoit Verbreuk. Uh, it's about how can you take into account the challenges of, and characteristics of um, hybrid warfare in the development of new grant strategies? It's interesting, um, when you read the Russian literature, they talk about these alternate approaches, but from the West, sometimes we look at hybrid warfare as a uh, really important a strategic initiative. With the Russians, the way they talk about it is it's a tool in their toolbox. We decide at this case, we wanna use hybrid warfare or alternate, alternate approaches. We use it. And what I would say is for uh, Western nations, hybrid warfare is not the only issue that we face. It's one of a variety of issues that we face. And so what I would say is you make sure it's on the table. You make sure you have capabilities to deal with it. Interesting thing, there was a study done of the Baltic states of what it would take to help them greatly um, prepare for a hybrid warfare attack by the, by the Russians. And it was surprisingly economic. It didn't take a tremendous amount of money. It did take preparation. So I would say um, you have to be willing to spend the time and invest in not in billions and billions of dollars, but investment in the planning and preparations to deal with it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Benoit, is that answering your question? All right. Then is it yeah. Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, for the next question.
question I, I wanted to, to, to ask Don Dreyer, if you, if you could ask uh, the, the question uh, live to, to Dr. Mason, I'll unmute you. One sec, Don Dreyer. Um, sure, okay. Um, do you have any suggestions for how to go about incorporating information operations into a war game? Because they're quite different depending on the purpose. Well, I, I think the first thing I would do is, um, this goes back to your homework, I would look and see how is information operations, how will they potentially impact um, military operations in whatever setting that you're looking at? And so I would say, I would include that. And there's a variety of ways to include it. Uh, from a purely mechanical way, uh, you could include the information warfare, possibly have some, some type of mechanism that uh, impedes your command and control. Uh, influences some of your stakeholders. You can use cards, you can use a chit draw, it's a variety of things. It doesn't, now you could have a game that's just about information warfare. In fact, I was asked uh, by Juan Carlos University about designing a game on information warfare. So it's possible to do it. But in this case, I would say information warfare uh, in a war game, it could be part of that game and it basically, how does that, how does manipulating that information uh, affect decisions and actions? And I, I would, I, it could be included in the game, but I would limit how much you put into it, unless it's specifically an informational war game. So thank you. Um, did, did, did that answer your question? Yeah, that's great, thanks. Cool. Thank you very much. So uh, the next question um, is from David Bates. Um, David, maybe you can um, sort of highlight what, what you are uh, meaning with the question, what are, are we looking for? Is it developing a, a 21st century version of the ODA loop? That, that is it really, it's funny that you bring up the ODA loop because um, you know, that name that I was having trouble uh, pronouncing, uh, the Russian that, that is the number one analyst on Western operations, he has a whole chapter on the OODA loop. And he talks about, um, he believes that the West is still very much interested in that concept and there's some value to it. But yeah, I, I think uh, the idea of the OODA loop was is that you're going to be able to react quicker and uh, take action faster than your opponent. Well, uh, hybrid warfare is similar, but what it does is the reason you're able to take action and move faster and do things quicker than your opponent is you've, you've slowed that opponent down and their ability to respond. That's what I was talking about. Um, you expand the number of problem sets that they have to deal with and you invalidate the solution sets they already have. So. Yeah, I guess in a way you could say we have to, this is developing a 21st century version of the loop, but it's coming from a different direction. It's not, it's not that you're moving faster, it's you're causing your opponent to move slower. Uh, thank you, David. Do you want to come back to that? No, thank you. That's, uh, that's very clear. Thanks. Okay. Um, thanks. Good question. Uh, questions are keep coming in so that, that's always good um i will uh, go to will capon uh, if that's pronounced correctly and after that i would like to ask uh, Bauke if, if you could uh, answer your question uh, but first um uh, will could you please um ask one of your two questions yeah so uh first one looking at china um they've got this vast economic base and it would seem that they're uh, hybrid operations focus much more on the economic aspects of, of this uh, sort of type of operation where they put massive pressure through um, investment in a nation, etc., to further their goal. How do you um, counter that sort of careful economic warfare? It's interesting. I... Uh... In preparation for this week, I was reading several articles and, and there's some people throw their hands up, nothing can be done. And uh, we're not sure what we can do. 
I don't agree with that. I think the the first thing is, if you look at an opponent like China, you know, there's a lot of talk about them looking long term. They're looking at 75 years from now, and this goes back to uh, my Clausewitz comment about centers of gravity. They're looking at developing centers of gravity. So how do we counter this? I think the West has to have a real honest um, discussion because it's interesting for the, the United States, a lot of decisions that we made that greatly empowered China in the past 20 years were very short-term decisions for short-term economic gain. I think that we have to get away from that and say, okay, we're gonna have to look at this instead of, you know, how does this help um, the European or the US stock market short-term? How do we protect ourselves long-term and start to project our strategic decisions farther out. Because right now, it seems like many of the things that we do in the West is very, very short-sighted, very short-term. Oh, great, we have a new contract with Huawei for cell phones. Well, we can make a lot of money in a short term. Yeah, but what, is, what does it mean when they have control over your, your 5G service in your country? What does that mean 20, 10 years from now? So I think that, I think from the Western point of view, you're gonna have to look, we're gonna have to look a lot farther out to counter these threats because you, you're absolutely right. Most of what, it, it's interesting, most of the Russian hybrid warfare is very, very politically motivated. Russia, Chinese hybrid warfare, much of that is very economically motivated. So we have to consider that motivation, but we also have to look at the uh, place where where that conflict's going to be, just like those centers of gravity they're developing, also where the battlefield's gonna be economically 50, 75 years. So that's what I would say, it would be looking farther out. Thank, thank you, thank you, Dr. Mason. Um, I hope that's uh, answering your question, Will. Yeah, that's Ripper, thank you. Cool, so um, let's continue uh, to the next question. Uh, Bauke, are you, um, are you ready to, uh, to ask your question? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for the presentation, very interesting. Uh, my question, I'll just read it out. It's, uh, what is a lesson that you've learned from running a hybrid warfare war game that you then have integrated in future design and why? Probably the, the biggest thing is um, trying to achieve the balance between fidelity and playability. Oh, look, I designed this game the fidelity is very high. I've got every single conceivable thing in it. And guess what? Game's totally unplayable and it doesn't go anywhere. I would say what I've learned from designing this stuff is there's got to be a balance. And some people, you know, they sometimes criticize. They say, oh, you know, your cyber game didn't include this or your hybrid game doesn't include this. You go, absolutely right. It doesn't. I had to make a conscious decision to leave something out. Why? Because... We're always looking at playability. And, and it's not just in a commercial sense. Most of the games that I design are not commercial games. We, you know, with my business, uh, my business partner, who's my wife, we kind of have an agreement that we limit, very much limit commercial war gaming. Why? Because it, it, it's hard to make a living doing that. So we focus on professional games, but you still have to consider playability. Uh, so I would say, what have I learned? I learned that there's got to be a balance between fidelity and playability. And you can't put everything in a hybrid game or cyber game or any type of a war game that you're going to be able to usefully manipulate to learn something. Thank you. And thank you again. So um, continue to the next question. Um, is it possible to receive a digital version of the used PowerPoint for the webinar? We will definitely um, check if it's not too big to send out and else we, we send you an um, sort of a degraded version if we have to take out some pictures. So yes, absolutely. No problem with that. Um, I would like to go to the next question. Um, Benoit, may, may I kindly ask you to, uh, to ask your question directly? Benoit is still there, else I'll, I'll read it for you. So how can you integrate uh, hybrid warfare in a field training exercise 
for increasing the level of knowledge on this thread? Well, how do you increase the knowledge is, remember I talked about my, my table with um, uh, papers six, you know, six inches deep. You can't give people that stuff, it's too much. I think there's a few seminal documents I would point to, and there's a few centers of excellence that are doing some excellent work on this. I probably pick something out from the Finns, from uh, the Finnish government, and, and surprisingly, somebody else that's been writing about are the, are the Poles. And so there are several, I think, uh, to the point Rand has done some excellent work, some basic documents that you can introduce the idea of hybrid warfare. Now, in a field exercise, uh, if this is strictly a field exercise, you can use the techniques of hybrid warfare to um, impact parts of that field exercise. The one that most the ones that come to mind would be command and control, maneuver. So you can include aspects of hybrid warfare operations that you might anticipate in the field and include them as uh, either a random event or some type of a factor that either inhibits or degrades your ability to conduct, conduct operations. That'd be off the top of my head, that would be the, what I would consider. Okay. Um, I'm just thank you very much. Ah, well, yeah, he's back. Thank you very much. So, so the next one is from Simon. I think uh, a, a really interesting question: if if there are any commercial war games uh, currently or in the past that you believe do a very good job in, um, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in re representing hybrid warfare. Um, this is a new topic. Uh, in commercial wargaming, uh, people are interested in games that, um, on topics that they're interested in. So uh, you're not gonna see a lot of hybrid warfare games in the new next Waterloo game or game about uh, the Germans versus the Russians on the Eastern Front. However, there are games that are being designed. Um, I can think of a couple by Joseph Miranda that includes situations like hyperwar that have um, hybrid war operations involved in that. So currently there's not that many. This is something new and also too uh, for commercial war gaming, they're going to design games that appeal to the commercial audience, not necessarily ones that are cutting edge as far as uh, military operations. Uh, Simon, is that an answer to your question? Or it you it does. So, so, Roger, thank you. I mean, my thought was that the GMT Next War uh, series of games is what I had in mind, but thank you very much for your answer. Yeah, I mean, Brian Train has done some stuff. You know, he's done some good things uh, off, off the top of my head. He's done a lot of work for GMT, so I would say, yeah, that's a possibility. Thank you. So, um, thank you. Uh, GMT, I'm not sure if everybody knows what that means. Yeah, it's a, that's the name of a commercial war game company. Ah, Roger. We'll, we'll find that on uh, on Google later. So I would like uh, to ask my uh, my Dutch mate, Ruud, if you, if you could ask uh, your question directly to Dr. Mason, if that's okay. Yeah, I, I think uh, I can. I was very intrigued by the uh, the piece on uh, the system analysis uh, part that, that you have to be able to understand the way the system should react in um, in case you're playing the game and uh, with the urban environment as a as a, a, a maximum of complexity, I was just wondering uh, how far have we come with uh, understanding that area and modeling it. Well, at how far we've come, it's, it's difficult to say because um, a lot of the work that's being done uh, is going to be classified, so it's not going to be open sourced. So I'm, I'm not going to be able to answer that. So I don't know how far we've come. However, how far could we go? I think that the possibilities for how far we could develop that um, are really open. There's a lot that can be done. And it's interesting, 
when you design it, when you're looking at these designs, uh, it goes back to the architecture and framework. If you have a good framework for the game, then you can apply things like your hybrid warfare concepts, tactics, whatever. You want to design a game about urban warfare. As long as it's a sound game, then you can add the pieces of hybrid warfare to it. Okay. Happy to do. Thank you. Okay. So, so the next one, I think, is it's it's also a really interesting question because deception is obviously one of the um, um, sort of uh, topics that's that's quite um, uh, current, especially if you look at into the um, uh, the current conflicts around the world. It's about deception and how would you incorporate that into into a hybrid war game modeling? Well. What is the purpose of deception in hybrid warfare? It's to inhibit your opponent. They're not sure what you're doing. They're not sure how they should respond. They, they're not sure what the, the correct solution is to the problem that you're presenting them because it's not clear what that problem is. So how do you incorporate that into the game? Well, very, very simple tools. Uh, command and control would be the first one your ability to make decisions and take actions. And second, your ability to maneuver. Those are two, those are two very, very simple. Simple one, you have, if you come up against a certain unit and uh, then uh, you run into a problem, if you're not sure what's going on, well then maybe your movement slows down. So it is possible to incorporate deception into a hybrid war, war game and those would be two simple ways of doing it. Now, uh, thank you. Um, They're really uh, helpful. Sorry, did you want to add something else, Dr. Mason? No, that's fine. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so, uh, the next question uh, basically, uh, I'm going back to the top. Um, Baukip um, uh, is asking you what's a lesson you've learned from running a hybrid warfare game? Uh, that you then have next integrated into future design and why? Well, I, I covered that one. Thank you. Oh yeah, I think I got that earlier. Oh. <laughs> don't include don't include everything in it. That's what I learned. Yeah. You'll, you'll bog down. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, continuing to add uh, to the next question, um, uh, which ones you would take? So, so I, I'd like to. Um, to take the one from, from Craig Thompson, uh, that's basically, so your presentation deals with, um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me again, uh, your, your presentation deals with applying classical wargaming to the high warfare arena. Are there any simulated programs that can utilize these principles? There may be, I'm not aware of them. There may be, that's possible. Um, it's, it's interesting. People ask me, they go, you know, Roger, do you design, uh, do you design computer games for this stuff? And most of my clients need a game very, very rapidly. They may need it 90 days or less. They're trying to solve a problem now. So I focus on classical war game techniques because that allows us to provide a solution for them. Now, have unlimited time. You know, and say, hey, uh, that, that was interesting. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't want to say something bad about my past, but in my experiences in the military, uh, I was a reservist, and I remember that uh, they would talk about, I, I would talk about things in the civilian world, and we needed 90 days or less, and I go to the Pentagon, and they're talking about fast-tracking something in two years. So... Specifically, no, I am not familiar with any attempts currently. There's uh, not commercial attempts that I'm aware of. Some that may include hybrid type uh, war games, but no, or hybrid type tactics, but not specifically just hybrid war games. I'm not aware of them, no. Doesn't mean they don't exist, I just don't, it's not aware of them. Okay, thank you. So uh, I would like to ask Steady or David Stead, if you uh, if you like uh, to ask your question, if that's possible. Uh, 
Hi, yeah, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the uh, for, for the presentation. Um, so there's there's quite a few questions about um, you know how we integrate various different aspects of the you know the very clear uh, laydown of of hybrid operations that you gave us, and it was really just if you if you had some thoughts on on how we actually you know kind of bring those together um, into a war game. Uh, it, itself and, and and yeah how we can actually pull all of those things together because i you know the, I, I like the idea of the dashboard but i um it seems quite uh you know there is an impact on the electrical system rather than actually being able to dig into the detail of you know how we might have that impact and what the level of impact might be and how that might affect different aspects of the um of the adversary or the adversaries over yeah i i think um, things like that, it depends on, on remember I, I talked about what was the setting of the game? Well, what's this game going to be used for? If the game is going to be focused on something like um, the impact on public utilities or the electromagnetic spectrum in a certain area during a hybrid uh, operation, yeah, then you probably don't want a dashboard because that's going to be that's going to be the battle space that you're looking at. That's what you're most interested in. However, uh, the idea of, uh, you know, the dashboard is not the only answer, but it is an example of an abstraction tool that you can use because to have a, to, to design a war game that's usable, you're not going to be able to put everything in it and you're going to have to abstract some things. However, there are things that are important that you still want to include. And what, what I call about is, including a flavor in the game. Um, uh, for example, in the dashboard thing, I, I talked about it. I think I had, um, it showed uh, communications or critical infrastructure. On the map that we were working with, we couldn't put every single bridge on that map. It was just too much. It cleared it up too much. So we used an abstraction. So I would say that it depends on what the use of the game is for. If the game's about utilities and their impact on loss of utilities then and the, elect, um, electro, the electric grid in a certain area, then it has, it, no, a dashboard wouldn't work. You'd want it specifically targeted that. But it's, a, it's always a balancing act. Thank you, sir. Um, so I think I'm afraid we, we're almost there. So maybe uh, there's time for one or two questions left. So the, the question that, that I think is, is, is pretty uh, uh, spot on is from Oli Donaghy, um, if, if I pronounce it correctly. Um, I, I like your idea because wargaming obviously is, is not only for fun, uh, for our profession as, as military, it's to prepare us for the real world. And therefore, I like your question about how can we ensure that players think like they need uh, to on operations rather than thinking about how to win the game. <laughs> Boy, that that's always a that's always an issue because remember when I talked about setting the game. You have to see what the end users are doing. Um, I've been involved in many games where it was designed for a uh, flag level person, either in civilian or uh, military settings, and you get there, and the general or the governor or whatever says, "Oh, well, I'm just going to observe." I've got this second lieutenant, he's actually going to play because I don't, I, I don't wanna demonstrate what I can do and what I can't do in this game. So that is always a problem. That's always an issue. And um, I think it's, it's the environment that you, you would introduce the games uh, and how the value you put in games and how you uh, use the games in your training or in your development or decision-making or whatever you're working on. If you go, your next evaluation depends, uh, your next officer evaluation depends on if you won the last war game. Well, of course, that's gonna have an effect. Nobody's gonna care what the real world's about. It's all about winning that game. So I think that you have to set the environment. War games cannot do everything. They have limited value and utility and you use that and you recognize it. You recognize their limitations. Um, you know, I, you know I, I, think, I think that that's something that you have to constantly balance. 
you know, I've used the word balance a lot. And I think that there's, in this case, <laughs> Dr. Mason, thank you very much for, for that, that, that answer. And I'm afraid that was, uh, for now at least, the last answer to, uh, to the questions. Um, before I, I uh, give the floor back, I would really like uh, to take this opportunity to thank all the participants for their questions. Um, unfortunately, we, we haven't gone uh, all the way down, but I think we, we, we managed to, uh, to address quite a few um, to, to Dr. Mason. So uh, thanks. Thanks for your honest and, and thought-provoking questions. Um, and, and, and Dr. Mason, of course, thanks for answering. At, yeah, you can send, you, send me an email if you have a big question you want to ask. My email's at the end. Just send me an email. I'll try to answer it for you in the email. And, and we will um, provide that email afterwards again if they missed it. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, please don't all desert because we have a few notices uh, at the end. Uh, the first one is that there's uh, also a poll that's active in the same Slido link. Um, you've got another day to fill it in, so you, if you want to do it now, please do, but you've got 24 hours, um, and that should help inform Fight Club's direction on hybrid wargaming. I'll just skip through that. Uh, second, I'm going to plug uh, the next uh, webinar in the series, uh, which is next week. Um, it is out on Twitter if you want to sign up exactly the same procedure as you've done so for this one. Um, this is to do with Wargaming and its benefits for training and education. Again, 90 minutes, uh, 60 minutes of uh, presentation um, uh, broken down into discussion panels uh, on set subtopics. Um, and we are joined by three guests, so that will not be a heavy slide deck, that will be more of a uh, Q&A and uh, talking around the themes as they emerge. So please do join us for that if you are interested. Uh, thirdly, uh, for current members of uh, Fight Club, uh, just a heads up, Operation Thunderclap, the inaugural live event, 18th to the 21st of Jan in Portsdown West. Um, if you are a member, you can register your interest on Slack in uh, due course. We're going to be uh, looking at a UK battle group um, current and with some future enhancements, uh, the details of which I will not discuss here. And we'll be doing that on two of our um, of our many uh, tools that we have: uh, flashpoint campaigns and uh, combat mission shock force two. And lastly, uh, for those who are not a member of Fight Club, if you do wish to join us, um, then please uh, head to Twitter, uh, go to our page, and uh, on our page you can see a small link at the bottom left. Uh, which is the link to sign up and you'll go through a small vetting process just to check you are who you say you are um, and then you'll be in and you'll be inside on the Slack able to contribute and get access to all um, the things I've mentioned. Um, uh, that's it from me. Uh, thank you all very much for attending. Um, this webinar will close in 10. Okay.